these small handful of molecules show up um, across all different life forms on Earth. So in the great kind of wealth of diversity that we have here in terrestrial uh, life, we the sort of underlying basis set of this biochemistry is are these biogenic elements. So naturally, we want to understand um, both how Earth was seeded with these elements, and then also what the inventory of these biogenic elements is on other worlds. So we can tackle these questions by studying the inheritance of carriers of these elements along the star and planet formation sequence. So when it comes to carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur, it turns out that carriers of these elements are regularly detected at all stages of star formation from the diffuse cloud stage all the way through the protoplanetary disk stage. So we have a pretty good understanding of the forms that these elements are stored in and the relative uh, chemistries that connect the carriers to one another. Um, phosphorus is really kind of the oddball when it comes to the biogenic elements. It turns out we have very few astrophysical constraints on what phosphorus is doing during star and planet formation. Um, so what we do know, um, a lot of detections of phosphorus carriers have been made towards massive star forming regions. So PN has been detected towards over 10 sources, PO towards a smaller number, but still a good handful. Um, when it comes to low mass star forming regions, PN and PO until recently were only detected towards a single uh, low mass protostar. That's the L1157B1 outflow shock. So all of this is to say that we really have almost no constraints on the phosphorus chemistry during the formation of solar type uh, stars and by extension, um, the formation of planets. Um, so just a little bit of context of what we have learned from massive protostars. Um, a big step forward was made a couple of years ago um, in a work where uh, the phosphorus carriers PN and PO were actually mapped towards a, ma a massive star forming region, AFGL 5142. So this is an image of the phosphorus emission towards the source. The little dashed lines here are tracing uh, where the outflow cavity is in the source. And you see that these little spots of emission show up, seeming to sort of trace the outflow cavity walls. So based on these observations, the authors sort of proposed a sequence for why we are seeing PN and PO emission, uh, where we do in the source. And essentially, um, this chemical sequence begins with the formation of phosphine on the grains, um, the sputtering of phosphine into the gas, followed by uh, photochemical dehydrogenation to form pH or atomic phosphorus. And then in the gas phase, you have reactions between P or pH with oxygen to first form PO, and then PO subsequently reacts with nitrogen to form PN. So that's sort of the picture um, that uh, sort of in the literature for why PN and PO are emitting um, within these outflow shocks. Okay, so as sort of a final bit of uh, motivation for why phosphorus I think is an uh, especially interesting problem um, is that when prebiotic chemists um, try to understand sort of the uh, ingredients in early earth scenarios for building up um, biomolecules, it turns out that the mineral forms of phosphorus like apatite actually have a very low solubility in water. And so this is one of the main kind of mineral reservoirs of phosphorus. And actually this can be a big bottleneck to prebiotic chemical schemes um, if you cannot sort of uh, dissolve enough phosphorus into solution to have it react with other prebiotic building blocks. So a couple of um, strategies have emerged to try to explain um, how to actually get enough accessible phosphorus into prebiotic chemical schemes. Um, one pathway is um, using metal phases of phosphorus like schreibersite. Um, and another option is actually delivering a more volatile form of phosphorus like PO. Um, so from very primitive uh, relics in our own solar system, like comets and meteorites, we have some constraints on um, these potential sort of solutions to the phosphorus uh, problem. So when we look at um, primitive meteorites, we see that um, these uh, refractory phosphorus carriers mainly are stored in the form of uh, this mineral appetite, but there is a sort of smaller um, percentage of schreibersite. And when we look at solar system comets, um, volatile phosphorus has actually been detected with a reasonably high abundance, um, suggesting that delivery of cometary ices could potentially um, be a way of delivering this volatile phosphorus for subsequent prebiotic chemistry. So this is sort of the landscape of what we know from our own solar system, but doing what I do, I'm really interested in understanding um, how sort of the different carriers 
um, and quantities of uh, phosphorus might be uh, inherited through the star and planet formation stages, and ultimately uh, what forms and quantities of phosphorus might be incorporated into planets. Okay, so a couple of years ago, we were very excited to discover the phosphorus carriers PN and PO towards the B1A uh, low mass proto star. So this is just the second time that phosphorus carriers have ever been detected towards the Sun-like star forming region. Um, so this is observations made with the IRM 30 meter telescope. You see these nice um, bright detections of PN and PO. Um, and we can do some sort of preliminary analysis of the uh, properties of phosphorus emission in the source using these single dish detections. So a main challenge is that we don't know how big the emitting area of the phosphorus molecules is in this source. And so when we try to derive column densities, we have sort of an order of magnitude uncertainty on the column density, depending on the, the emitting source size. Um, but nevertheless, we can still get some sort of crude constraints on the phosphorus abundance that's contained in PN and PO in this source. And it's between about 10 to the minus 10 and 10 to the minus 9 with respect to hydrogen. So this consists of essentially less than a percent of the solar phosphorus abundance, um, implying that phosphorus is really quite heavily depleted from the gas phase um, in this source. So even though we're seeing some phosphorus in the gas, it's really just a small kind of component of the total phosphorus reservoir. Um, now, we weren't able to get spatial information about where phosphorus was coming from uh, with these observations, but there were sort of existing images of SIO emission in B1A at the time. And the SIO um, is an outflow tracer. So we can see the SIO is really uh, kind of tracing this outflow structure coming out south of the source. And so at the time, we sort of speculated that some sputtering of a solid phosphorus carrier is happening within these outflow shocks, explaining why we're seeing anything in the gas phase. Okay, so now sort of the exciting part is actually um, following the source up with ALMA and getting um, real images of where the phosphorus molecules are emitting from in this source. So jumping straight into it, these are the maps of PN and PO that we obtained with ALMA. So the white contours that you're seeing here are the dust continuum. This is tracing either the disk or proto-disk of the protostar. And then we see emission of the phosphorus molecules from these two kind of distinct emission clumps, uh, one to the north and one to the south. And in both cases, they're well offset from where the disk is actually forming. Um, so just for a quick comparison, in the high mass source that was imaged a few years ago, this emission also showed these very distinct clumpy structures. So this uh, clumpy emission morphology seems to be a sort of consistent trend in how phosphorus molecules are emitting from protostellar environments. Okay, so we can use these observations to try to understand why phosphorus is actually in the gas phase um, in the source. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is sort of test our hypothesis for whether phosphorus is emitting from the outflow like we speculated back in 2019. Um, so when I put up the SIO emission maps on top of PN, we see that it's sort of somewhat spatially associated with the outflow, but it's not co-spatial fully with the SIO outflow. So this was actually a little bit surprising that the phosphorus molecules are not um, kind of emitting from within this outflow traced by SIO. So we scratched our heads a little and we're looking through other lines um, in our data and ended up finding um, that CCS traces this really kind of interesting filamentary structure. So CCS is a tracer of very dense and chemically pristine material. So the fact that we're seeing um, the uh, emission like we do really suggests that the phosphorus is being populated into the gas in regions where this SIO outflow is actually encountering this interstellar filament. So this sort of explains um, potentially why you need this very kind of um, special configuration between the outflow and some clumpy interstellar material to actually release phosphorus into the gas. Um, so we can also look at the emission patterns of other um, line tracers, and in particular, ice tracers are a really interesting comparison. So SO2 is an ice sublimation tracer, and we see that it's actually pretty perfectly co-spatial with the PN emission. So this is telling us that um, the PN is sort of originating from shocks that are much weaker than the shocks required to make um, SIO emission, because we're seeing sort of um, ice sublimation um, co-spatial with the PN emission. So we can use these emission patterns to try to say something about 
um, the actual identity of the phosphorus carrier in the grain phase. Um, so here I'm showing some sort of uh, a plot of the volatility of different uh, reference molecules. So on the top is uh, more refractory sort of mineral phases, and on the bottom is more volatile uh, phases. So based on the emission patterns that we see, we think that the phosphorus molecules in this source should actually be um, more volatile than silicates because we're seeing this emission, emission co-spatial with these ice sublimation tracers and not with emission of SIO. On the other hand, we think that the parent phosphorus carrier has to be less volatile than simple ices like water. And the reason for this is that phosphorus molecules are never actually detected towards hot cores where you do see pure thermal sublimation of ices like water. So it seems like some shocking or energetic processing has to happen um, for the phosphorus to enter the gas, unlike these very simple ices. Okay, so if we put up the sort of candidate um, phosphorus carriers based on our understanding of solar nebula phosphorus chemistry, um, there are a couple of different um, candidates here. And based on the volatility patterns that we see, we think that we can actually exclude that the metal phase of phosphorus is responsible for the PN and PO emission. And the reason for this is that the volatility is too similar to silicates. So if this was metal phase uh, phosphorus that we we're seeing, we'd expect its emission to look much more like the SIO outflow. So instead, some sort of phosphate uh, mineral or phosphorus oxide has a volatility that is uh, more consistent with what we expect based on these emission patterns. Now, another sort of interesting implication of this is that um, both of these carriers actually contain PO bonds. And so it's um, the sort of previous chemical scheme that I showed um, involved the formation of PO following pH uh, release into the gas uh, reacting with atomic oxygen. Um, but if this is actually the green carrier, it's potentially um, the case that you're actually initially populating the gas directly with PO and then only converting it to PN um, over time in the gas. Okay, so another sort of um, asset of uh, spatially resolved observations is we can get really good constraints on column densities. So like I said before, we had really only weak um, kind of bounds on the column densities of these molecules. The picture is totally different when we can resolve the emission. So here we're looking at the column density maps of PN and PO across the protostar. And this allows us to actually understand how the volatile composition of phosphorus is varying across the source. So um, this is reflected by the PN, uh, PO over PN ratio. We can make maps of this uh, volatile composition of phosphorus now. And we see that it spans from around one to eight. Um, what's really interesting is that there seems to be actually a systematically lower PO to PN ratio in this northern emission clump. So you can see here sort of the distribution of PO to PN ratios in the two emission clumps. Um, and it's a sort of uh, lower and narrower distribution compared to the southern clump. Um, so what is potentially uh, responsible for the origins of this chemical differentiation? There are a couple of options. Um, first of all, it could be a photochemical effect. So this was proposed um, in the study of the high mass star forming region to explain um, sort of a trend in which PO to PN increases with UV field in this high mass source. And the idea is that PO is more um, readily dissociated by UV than PN. So you end up with a higher PO to PN ratio as you get further from the protostar. Um, in B1A, we don't really see the same clear trend. Um, there is somewhat higher PO to PN ratios at this um, more distant emission clump than the closer emission clump, but overall there's not really a monotonic trend with um, distance from the protostars, so I think it's unclear if that's really responsible for the patterns that we're seeing. Um, this could also be a chemical effect. So essentially, um, like I showed before, we expect the PO to PN ratio to really be regulated by how much oxygen and nitrogen are, are in the gas based on the efficiencies of these reactions here. Um, so I think there is sort of evidence for this in um, the emission patterns that we observe in our data. So if you look at um, methanol emission, it's much weaker towards the northern emission clump than the southern, southern emission clump. And this is exactly what we see for PO as well. So this sort of suggests that the uh, southern emission clump has more gas phase oxygen due to more ice sputtering that's driving a higher PO to PN ratio. 
Um, lastly, this could be a time effect. So like I said, maybe if you're decomposing some phosphorus uh, PO containing um, minerals, it's simply a matter of time um, before it's converted to PN. Um, and so the PO to PN ratio would then be set by sort of a, a temporal evolution in PO and PN. Okay, so um, we can now sort of put together some pieces for how uh, volatile phosphorus is inherited along the star formation sequence. Um, in particular, one really interesting question is trying to understand the origin of volatile phosphorus that has been recently detected in cometary ices. Um, so when we look at dense clouds, we know that gas phase phosphorus is not really present. Um, and the inference is that um, essentially the entire phosphorus reservoir in the early stages of star formation is stored in refractory or semi-refractory material. Um, so if this material was just inherited um, intact, you wouldn't expect to detect volatile phosphorus in comets. Instead, we think it's likely that the protostellar stage is actually playing an important role in converting some of this refractory phosphorus to a more volatile form through these outflow shocks. And so um, potentially there's some uh, kind of important conversion of uh, refractory to volatile phosphorus that's happening um, to explain uh, detections of volatile phosphorus in cometary ices. Um, and indeed, when we look at the um, phosphorus abundance in comet 67P compared to B1A, we see that the volatile phosphorus reservoir in these two sources is pretty similar, sort of consistent with this picture in which um, both cases are originating from these interstellar shocks. Okay, so broadly speaking, is B1A comet-like then? Um, so here I'm showing the same sort of x-axis as the volatile phosphorus abundance parameterized by PO plus PN over uh, methanol in the source, and the y-axis is showing the volatile phosphorus composition or PO over PN. So while the abundance of volatile phosphorus seems quite similar between B1A and comet 67P, the uh, volatile phosphorus composition looks quite different. So we see a much lower PO to PN ratio in B1A compared to the um, lower limit inferred for comet 67P. So there, I think it's still sort of unclear exactly what's causing um, this uh, kind of distinct composition in the protostar and the comet. It's possible that there's some subsequent ice chemistry between the protostellar and disk stage that is reshuffling uh, the main uh, volatile phosphorus carrier or potentially we just had a higher oxygen to nitrogen um, elemental abundance in the solar nebula compared to B1A. But I think uh, we, we would really like more observations to actually uh, try to understand better the range of uh, volatile compositions in, in more protostars. Um, so with that, I will just summarize. Um, of the main biogenic elements, we have really by far the fewest astrophysical constraints on phosphorus. Um, we think that interstellar shocks are playing a key role in converting from a semi-refractory phosphorus carrier to a more volatile form prior to the formation of comets. We do see large uh, local variations in the PO to PN ratio. Um, this could be due to UV, chemical, or temporal effects, but essentially we need more resolved observations. Um, and while the solar system's volatile phosphorus content seems quite typical, the composition is quite distinct between um, the uh, solar system and these low mass protostars. So we need essentially just a lot more data to try to understand what's going on um, with the phosphorus chemistry in these sources. So with that, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you for the lovely talk, Dr. Brugner. Um, there's one question in the Q&A. Can you see it or do you want me to read it to you? Um, yeah, I can see it. So yeah, this is from Rich Say Kelly. What is known about the energetics and kinetics of the PO slash PN reactions that you discussed? Um, I don't think they're that well experimentally verified. I think a lot of it comes from um, kind of, yeah, modeling the chemical reactions. Um, but, but yeah, I would have to double check. I think certainly, as far as all of the phosphorus, um, oh, sorry, another chat. Anyways, as far as all of the phosphorus chemistry goes, I think we're a little bit behind on the um, experimental side, just because um, it hasn't really been a focus of the lab astro community. So I would say that we would greatly um, appreciate having better kind of experimental constraints on how some of these reactions proceed. Ah, okay. <laughs> 
Do we have any other questions? I think you did a great job with the talk. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're going to go on to our next speaker, um, Dr. Poston. Um, he has his degrees in chemistry, specifically focusing on analytical experiments um, and experiments in the vacuum domain. He did his PhD at Georgia Tech, um, focusing on lunar diurnal water. Um, and he is now a research scientist at Southwest Research Institute. He focuses and is continuing his work on uh, lunar studies, especially spectra from the UV to the mid-infrared. Um, he did a postdoc at Caltech in between, primarily using um, the UHV apparatus by Carlson and Hand. Um, and he is going to talk about some of that work, I believe, today. I will turn it over to him. Hello? We can hear you and we can see your slides. All right. And I don't have any view of my own video, so I don't know if it's even on. Your video is on and it is focused a little lower than your head. Oh, uh, yeah. It's one of those laptops with a really low camera. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Um, yeah. Thank you, Heather, uh, for inviting me and that introduction. Uh, as I, I think you mentioned, uh, today I'll be talking about the. Oh, we're not advancing. There we go. Uh, the work that I did um, with a KISS uh, Keck Institute for Space Studies project while postdocing at Caltech JPL. And um, I want to draw attention to, um, let's see, Ahmed Ajab, who is who was another postdoc on that project and, and really helped out quite a bit. And you'll see that in, in the references of the papers. He, he actually ended up writing more of the papers than I did in the end. Uh, so, but we're going to move into, um, in, instead of kind of interstellar, as I viewed the last uh, presentation, I guess we're, there, there's, there's overlap in that we, we can apply the results from the lab here to interpreting uh, some of the telescope and uh, 67P type observations. Uh, but for the most part, I'll be focusing on lab work. So the, I'll start out with the motivation hypothesis for the overall project. Um, describe the equipment experiments, focus mainly on uh, visible near infrared results, so a little bit light in the chemistry, sorry about that. And then I'll focus in more on the chemistry uh, towards the last few slides. So this project was really uh, inspired by some observations of small Trojan asteroids. These are the asteroids that lead and follow Jupiter at the, uh, Sun, Jupiter, L4, and L5 Lagrange points. And they saw that these uh, asteroids, the small ones, uh, fit neatly into one of two groups. There's either the less red group or the red group. Then uh, looking at small Kuiper belt objects, there's also a bimodal color distribution, although the colors don't match. In this case, they are a red group and a very red group. So this, this caused um, kind of um, Mike Brown, his grad student Ian Wong, and then uh, Josh Emery and uh, Jordana Blacksburg were the other leaders of the study. Uh, they, they just went in and, and scratched their heads and said, well, what if this is actually supporting a Nice model type rearrangement of the solar system? Perhaps all of these bodies formed in the same initial population and then were split and scattered into these two locations and mixed together um, as the solar system was rearranging. So about the time that we started the, the actual work where I was joining up, the hypothesis was, was starting to arrive at hydrogen sulfide. And this came out of some modeling that the in the primordial planetesimal disk, the, the objects would have formed right around the H2S sublimation line. So if the, if the object is forming outside of this line, further away from the sun, it, it would be able to have H2S stable in its surface and, and incorporate this sulfur source into the surface. But if it's inside that line, it won't necessarily be able to have significant uh, sulfur in the, in the surface. Uh, so then after you've formed these bodies, you shake up the solar system, some go to a little bit further out and 
become the KBOs and because it's cold there, they're produced, uh, uh, preserved at least thermally. And then the Trojan asteroids would have gone in and gotten warmer. And that uh, was hypothesized to have altered their surfaces. Um, the box on the right is to remind me to mention that the another observation from the telescopes, uh, because they're pretty much all telescope observations, uh, was that the Trojans had lower albedo than the Kuiper Belt objects. So uh, putting it in words, the uh, sulfur-containing irradiation products present, present in the crust of the redder group of Trojans KBOs and not in the less red groups are hypothesized as the key difference necessary to produce the observed color bimodality in the two subpopulations, given a, a Nice model or similar uh, solar system rearrangement where Trojans and KBOs had formed in the same location. And we, we made three predictions that we went into the lab to test. Those predictions were that the spectral slopes as we went through our experiment um, should become steeper in the irradiated um, mixtures that did contain the hydrogen sulfide than the mixtures that did not contain the hydrogen sulfide. Uh, and then when we go to the later part of the experiment, which I'll describe in two slides, sorry, uh, the, the irradiated films should become less bright upon heating to the Trojan light temperatures and uh, under continuing irradiation. And then the spectral slopes should also change and those should become less steep compared to the uh, preheating. So they become steeper, or sorry, less steep when you go into the Trojan-like temperatures. So uh, in the lab, we, uh, I think it was already mentioned, this is uh, Kevin Hand and Bob Carlson's lab um, using their Minos chamber um, at JPL. The chamber uh, during the experiments would be in the mid 10 to the minus nine Tor range. We had a helium cryostat for controlling the sample temperature. Uh, we, the irradiation we were using was a 10 keV electron gun. This is in part um, because this chamber was built for Europa, where that's a pretty common sort of radiation. Um, but also, secondary electrons do a lot of the work in an irradiation process. So, so we, we argue that this is a sufficiently representative um, irradiation source. And then uh, we, we get our results. We interrogate the sample with a, a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer to look at the, the chemical bonding. Um, and then for comparison to the telescopes, it's almost all visible near infrared data. So a vis near our grading spectrometer and then a mass spectrometer was used to monitor what desorbed throughout the experiment and went into the vacuum phase. Uh, the experiments themselves were, were all, we, we varied a few parameters as are described in the table below, but there was a general theme that we intentionally kept of we would chill and do and build the ice um, at 50 Kelvin by uh, depositing, we, we would mix the, the different gases in the gas phase and then flow them onto the, the cold mirror at a controlled rate uh, to build the ice. Uh, the irradiation would then commence and we would take spectra throughout. And then once we had completed the radiation at 50 Kelvin, we called that the Kuiper Belt Object Simulation, and we would proceed to then shake up the solar system and um, heat slowly to 120 Kelvin uh, with continued radiation and hold there to say, okay, this represents now the stable state for a Trojan asteroid. And then finally, I will show data from the heating uh, up to 300 Kelvin just to reset the experiments basically. Um, but we did see some important results during that phase. So it was worth collecting those data even though they weren't nominally part of the experiment. Uh, the, the ices were built to various thicknesses ranging from a thin ice to a very, very thick, um, 100 times thicker. So two microns up to 200 microns uh, estimated thickness. And uh, we, we did a couple different geometries, a specular one where we're getting the light that potentially had reflected directly off of the mirror after passing through the sample, as well as a off specular so that we were only getting scattered uh, light. So before we went into our three and four ice mixtures, um, we, we wanted to check out the experiment with something that was known. This would be uh, methanol was what we chose. And this gives me an, a chance to introduce what the data look like. Uh, so the, the top left 
is the kind of the raw data. This is the actual signal collected. Uh, we had two different gradings and two different detectors in the visible near infrared. So that's why you see two overlapping sets of data here. Um, but then we could, I'll show results corrected um, to include possible reflection off of the underlying gold mirror. And then uh, bottom left is removing the gold from, you know, assuming that the gold reflection is unchanged throughout the experiment, you can then uh, just look at what the ice looks like. And then um, in, in the later experiments, I didn't actually have the ability to look at the gold because I wasn't in the specular position for the, uh, the spectroscopy. So I had to divide it by the unirradiated ice in those experiments. Those are relative to the ice. So I'm about to show you even more squiggly lines. Um, the, but don't worry, there's a, there's a theme to how they're set up. Uh, the left column will always be the apparent reflectance, like what I just showed you, where if we receive less signal, you see that in the plot as it goes down, uh, uh, you'll just have less. Ref oh. We can still hear you. Now we can't hear you. Does your headset battery die? Oh, now you're back. Maybe. There we go. Hang on. Let me get back to this microphone. Sorry, it, it does that with Zoom and not with WebEx. I don't know why. Okay. Um, can you hear me again? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry Squiggly about line. that. Yeah. OK, so the left column will be kind of tracking albedo. And then the right column, if I can get to advancing again, there we go, uh, will be tracking the, the redness. So I, I think I might have skipped over defining redness in case anyone isn't familiar with how it's used in this uh, subfield. Um, the, it's really just characterizing the slope. Uh, so a steeper slope, uh, a steeper positive slope from left to right will be redder. Um, all right, and then the, the compositions, I uh, mentioned them for the first time. Uh, the three ice is the water, methanol, and ammonia mixture. And then the with sulfur experiments will be adding, so we still had water, methanol, and ammonia, and we added H2S into that mixture. So um, again, these are, are so sorry, on to the, the actual results. Um, this was a, our, our first experiment with a thin ice in the specular, so transmission, reflection, transmission geometry. Um, if you've managed to understand how to, I described to interpret these plots, uh, it, it'll be obvious that we have on the left, we have a slight decrease in the apparent reflectance or our proxy for albedo. And then you can see kind of the, the rotating of the spectra on the right around that 950 normalizing point, And that indicates, in this case, reddening. Uh, so those were as expected if the hypothesis was correct. Um, but we, we weren't expecting these possible absorption bands that show up at about 900, 600, and 400 um, nanometers. So but I've, I've talked about the gold a bit, and that was perhaps foreshadowing for the fact that we were worried about um, are, are these bands perhaps some sort of thin film effect where you get constructive and destructive interference uh, based on the thickness of your film? I was able, able to eliminate that. But we also were worried that we might have refractive index matching between the gold mirror and the, the products of the irradiation that could lead to um, just less reflection at the gold and then absorption in the gold instead of uh, this being an actual absorption band of the material. Uh, so we decided to make the really thick ices. Oh, and I got ahead of myself. Um, just real quick, uh, and then we'll get back to that line. Uh, the absorption bands, just trying to make it so I can actually see my slides there, or my preview. There we go. Uh, the, as I mentioned, there are some interesting results from the heating phase of the experiments, the kind of the just resetting phase. So here we can see that the spectra 
do actually, uh, these possible absorption bands are lost as things become volatile, as the entire, the, the host ice, if you will, the water, methanol especially, will desorb in vacuum around 160 Kelvin. And as those, uh, any unreacted ices were being lost, we also lost the, the majority of the um, possible absorption features that I mentioned. Um, and then in this case, above 190 Kelvin, we pretty much lost enough of our thickness that we weren't really detecting uh, the radiation products at all. Um, so, sorry, back to the um, back to the scattering topic, or the or perhaps um, absorption with refractive index matching topic. We decided to make a really thick ice. Uh, to try and take the gold mirror out of the picture completely. And this revealed slightly different behavior. Uh, so you can see from the plots that the, the water methanol ammonia mixture now looks more flat rather than having a slight red slope. But the um, mixture where we also include the H2S has a very steep slope now. Uh, and then also, the water methyl ammonia is pretty reflective, only nine, you know, 80%, 90% reflective still, whereas the H2S containing ice was down to less than 10% reflection. Uh, so this and the absorption features that I mentioned remain. So this convinced us that it wasn't dominated by the, the gold in any way. Um, but it also got us to thinking about, are we absorbing or are we scattering the, uh, the light? So is this an absorption, which means we're putting energy from the light into the sample, um, or are we just scattering out of the particular uh, viewing geometry that we have? Um, so we set up another thick ice experiment, but we moved the, uh, we reconfigured the chambers that we were not viewing in, in the, um, specular reflections geometry, we're actually out of the principal plane entirely, only viewing scattered light. So we, um, uh, and in this case, we saw that irradiation actually increased the signal, which to me says we were increasing the amount of scatterers. Um, we were, we we're getting more signal scattered out of that original reflection rather than the decrease in signal we'd seen before being absorption only. Um, but our other trends generally remain. Uh, we do get a reddening again in the, um, in the no sulfur mixture, but we, we got really deep absorption or uh, really deep bands at 900, 600 and 400 microns in the, sorry, nanometers. I've been seeing microns this whole time, I'm sorry. Uh, nanometers. Um, so those absorption bands are still real. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of scattering and absorption ultimately. And uh, during the heating for this one, uh, I was I was able to go really methodically and learn from the prior experiments. So I was able to go a few, maybe five, ten Kelvin at a time and then let everything equilibrate and then move again. So we confirmed that the absorption bands um, do go away at 160 Kelvin, even when we go very slow for lab scales. Um, and then there's this, still this subtle flattening around 160, 170 Kelvin. Um, we had a, a brightening as well. And since we're in the specular geometry, that to me says that um, we have a decrease in albedo as far as the telescope would see. So this is probably a bit of an eye chart, um, but if you are really interested in the details, uh, we have a nice summary uh, in tabular form in the paper, but perhaps easier in a presentation form is these summary plots where I've taken all three experiments and the solid lines in various shades of red are the, um, the with sulfur experiments and then the dotted lines in various shades of black are without sulfur. And since these are, are all normalized plots, what you're seeing here is again, focusing on the, the reddening or lack thereof. 
Uh, so we, we were able to conclude that the mixtures with the sulfur experienced more reddening with ra radiation than the mixtures without. And we're pretty confident that these uh, absorption features are, uh, are real. They're definitely consistent among the three different ways of doing the experiment. And we found that both mixtures tended to darken with heating to Trojan-like temperatures, especially in the non-specular geometry. Um, and the slopes also became less steep with the uh, with sufficient heating. And I say sufficient heating because uh, the ranges proposed for Trojan asteroids range uh, during during a, a rearrangement of the solar system, uh, range from, I think it's 120 to about 180 Kelvin as the temperatures those bodies would have experienced. So we found that to really get behaviors in the lab that matched what has been seen with the uh, telescope observations, we have to be towards the hotter end of that range, like 160 to 180. Um, so I don't know whether we can say we confirmed the hypothesis or not, but I think we constrained you know, this lab work constrains the history that those objects would have had, had to have had for this hypothesis to, to be right. Uh, so a conclusion slide for this part. Um, I think I just said all of this. The, the Trojans must have warmed significantly in order for this hypothesis to be correct, but we are within the proposed range, so we, we're still okay there. Um, the absorption features that we saw in the lab have not been observed on the Trojan asteroids, which, I mean, if we had to heat this far, that actually is consistent. Uh, so that's that's all good. And then the Trojans. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, we're just gonna go to the the poor quality laptop microphone because it's real. Um, the where was I? The Trojan the Trojans also did become or Trojans are less bright than KBOs, which again required that warming. So we pretty strongly constrained if this this whole story is right, the Trojans also had to have been pretty hot uh, during their their history at some point. Um, pretty hot for an outer solar system object. Um, some caveats are that extrapolation from lab conditions to geological time scales is always something you just have to accept and do the best you can to, to think around. Um, but that's always limitation. Uh, and then the Trojan asteroids, if they got this warm, a lot of their ices would have been lost. So non-ices may also play a role. And, and there are papers out there suggesting Trojan asteroids might be dominated by silica for their spectra anyways. Um, but that doesn't necessarily change the contribution that would come from these organic residues or uh, um, these complex residues. So these are additional parts of the story for future work. Um, but we don't understand at this time what their contribution is. So moving on to the, I promised a little bit of chemistry. So here's uh, a few figures from the papers we've published on the chemistry aspect. So in the, the hyperbelt simulation part, the 50 Kelvin part of the experiments, uh, we were able to identify many of the functional groups that were there in the spectroscopy. A lot of these will hopefully look even more familiar to the audience than they, they are to me. Um, and we see that the absorption depth of these um, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen type compounds decreases when we add the sulfur. And we also see OCS form at the 50 Kelvin stage of the experiment. We get additional sulfur species forming during the heating. So I, I like to think of this as um, these are thermal reactions, but it took the radiation to set them up. Uh, so we see carbon and sulfur appearing during, sorry, car a carbon sulfur molecule or, or bond at least um, showing up during the heating as well as uh, carbon disulfur um, 
absorption feature. And then we also were monitoring the mass spectrometer and we saw many, uh, si significant evidence for more complex sulfur compounds uh, than just H2S as well. So here we have sulfur oxygen species or sulfur polymers starting to form. Here we have evidence for as large as uh, four sulfur chain. And uh, these sulfur chains um, also interact with carbon or hydrocarbon groups. So we ended up with sulfur chains and sulfur oxygen um, chains that were then sandwiched between uh, methyl groups or carbon hydrogen um, bonds at the ends of these groups. And finally, we also pulled out the, um, the residue that remained once the entire experiment had been reset. And we took higher signal to noise spectra of that. And we can confirm um, some of those sulfur chains show up here in the 400 to 600 wave number region, as well as here, uh, which is here and just shown in microns instead of wave numbers. And then uh, GCMS of um, I scraped the, the films off of the mirror and went through a, a standard derivation, derivatization process that the sessions lab at Caltech uses and then did GCMS. And we can see just dramatically different um, compounds re remaining in the residues between these two. You have sulfur rings by this point in the experiment. Um, whether those were rings or not in the ice, we of course can't definitively know with these data. Um, but, and interestingly enough, the only common molecule was in fact chlorine. Um, so that's a very stable molecule. Uh, so the kind of the overall conclusion from that part is that sulfur when present dominates the chemistry. Oh, thank you, sorry about all the bumps. Um, oh, uh, real quick, unless there's a bunch of questions already. No, okay. Um, Jenny mentioned um, phosphorus in HEMA 67B. Um, Ahmed has been continuing to work with these data, whereas my, um, my work here at SWERI has pushed me back to the moon where I did my graduate work. Uh, but Ahmed has found some possible applications to the Kuiper Belt object Arakoth, which New Horizons did a flyby of. And he also has found some uh, possible um, applications for this work at Comet 67P from some of the uh, portions of the mission where they were able to look at the less volatile compounds. So uh, the, the Arkoff paper is published and he's currently um, going back and forth with the re reviewers on the 67P work. So that'll be coming out hopefully in, uh, um, well, accepted hopefully within the next couple of months, but we'll see how long that ends up taking. And now I'm actually done, sorry. I apologize, that was great, thank you. Um, if anybody has questions, please post them in the Q&A. I was going to ask a question to start, um, which was in the first set of experiments where you were looking at the reddening and you kept talking about the absorption bands when you add the H2S. So do you have any idea what they are, <laughs> the absorption bands? Or not really? Yeah, we actually found some evidence that those could be those um, sulfur chains. Oh, right. That actually sense. went looking for the sulfur chains in the... Uh, the residues and the other and the mass spectrometer as a result of the best identification we could find for those was uh, short sulfur chains. And those may also have been seen on Jupiter's moon EO or I, depending on where you're from. Yeah, very cool. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, I have a quick question. Uh, I was, have you tried doing the same experiments without ammonia present? Does that alter things very much as well? Yeah, that was that was beyond the scope of this work, unfortunately. Um, so that, that's an open opportunity. Okay. I, I want to say that like water and methanol have been mixed, maybe even by you, um, Chris. <laughs> I know you've done the pure methanol um, irradiation. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just yeah, I, I can't remember, I, I can't think of whether there's been water, methanol, and H2S done with those three together without the ammonia. There's pure H2S, there's water and methanol. But yeah, I don't I don't know if that exact combination's been done. <laughs> 
Yeah, and if it has, I'm sh I don't think that they've done a study on the reddening effects of it, specifically in the visible. Yeah, and one one other unique thing about this, when I started this postdoc, I was like, this has got to have been done. Like, <laughs> so I I uh, was just digging through the literature, and what I found out was the what was kind of unique and why we needed to do these experiments was again the exact mixtures and then the temperatures. 50 Kelvin to 120 Kelvin is kind of in between. Most of the interstellar medium stuff is much colder than 50 Kelvin. And then a lot of the other work is icy moons. So you're at least 100, 120 Kelvin, if not pushing, pushing the vol uh, sublimation temperatures of the ices. Uh, so I didn't find very many results um, in this temperature range and very many results that actually included visible spectra which was our key observation we were actually trying to compare with. The chemistry was almost just a side bonus. Sure. Okay, thanks. Well, I wanna thank all of our speakers today, both Dr. Michael Poston and Dr. Jenny Bergner and all of you for attending, we really appreciate it. And um, we hope to see you at our May Astro Seminar. You can guys can look, listen to this one um, on our YouTube channel if you haven't subscribed yet. <laughs> uh, thanks very much.